Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. More on them later. All right, here we go. Sup, I'm Elias. Okay, so you remember how a few months ago where I did a video talking about the best fantasy trilogy I've ever read in my entire life? Well, I just want to kindly and calmly reiterate that in this video, I'm actually going to be talking about the best fantasy trilogy I've ever read in my entire life. Ladies and gentlemen, this trilogy is The Last Ship Trader Trilogy by Robin Hobb. Now, hear me out. This was so different, so epic, so worthy, Avengers worthy in every way. The payoff for this, this whole series in general, it was just so beautiful, leveling up, elevated, everything. Everything about it was just perfection, 100%. However, each book on its own is a different story. Fun fact, I actually gave each book a different rating. In this video, I'm going to be talking about and discussing some of the things that happened and went on with the series, why you should read it, if and actually if you should start with the series or start with the Farsi trilogy, um, what order you should read them in, and whatnot and everything about that. So, obviously I'll be going to the non-spoiler parts first before we dive in into the spoiler parts, just like I did for the uh, Farseer video. So before I get into all this, I'm actually pretty proud of myself for finishing and completing this series as is um, during this year, because it seemed to me that I read the Farseer trilogy such a long time ago, when in fact um, I finished the third book this year. I finished the first book back in March, and then I went ahead and went into the second book, like a couple months later, back in June, I want to say, at the end of June, and I finally finished it close to the end of July, and then I went ahead immediately, straight up after the ending of the second one, picked up the third one, and I finished it in three days. So each book, collectively, sort of has a different rating and a different time when I read it, and the speed at which I finished it as well. So the first book is The Ship of Magic, followed by the second one, Mad Ship, and finally, third is The Ship of Destiny. Now, this will be a little bit different from the Farsi trilogy just because this is the type of series where I think you really need to take your time and ingest and digest all of the characters and the worlds that you're in, the setting. Robin Hum's writing, again, I can't speak enough about her writing. It is just so goddamn good, like god tier. Like, I don't think I've ever read such characterization, such an ensemblance of storytelling, and just putting it all together. Again, you know when you're watching the Avengers movie, the Infinity Arc, right? All those years, all those movies that you took your time to invest in, all those years, right, of your life, waiting for this culmination of just events to happen, the payoff in this was just so satisfying, so sweet. That huge dose, that boost of serotonin, it just gave me 10 years of my life back. So, all right, so before we get into the discussion, the non-spoiler discussion, so many of you guys were DMing me, sending me messages saying whether or not you should start with this series or start off with the Farsi trilogy first. And aside from that, that you've actually started the series first before you read the Farsi trilogy. And I feel like, honestly, asking me that question where you should start, it's honestly up to you. I feel like, personally for me, I felt a higher satisfaction reading these books in publication order. So I'm basically talking about in regards to the first three trilogies of each consecutive trilogy, if that makes any sense. So I feel like if you start with any of those nine books overall, you read and complete each of those sets in a different order, um, instead of publication order, you still will overall get the complete satisfaction of each set of each trilogy. Now, I haven't read the third trilogy going in yet, which I already did order, it's on its way, but so many of you guys actually started with the third trilogy first, and then the Lightship Traders, and then a lot of you guys actually haven't read the Farsi trilogy, which I'm like, interesting, okay, but so many of you guys actually read and loved this, and so many other of you guys still have to actually read this. So it's just really interesting to me how so many of us are just on different sets of trilogies without completing the other, if you get what I mean, if you get my gist. Some of you have actually started with the third trilogy before reading the second, um, without even reading the Farsi trilogy at all in the first place. So that is just interesting to me. And yet you guys are still enjoying the world in of itself as a whole. So, I mean, yeah, you do what's, you know, what works for you, what's best for you. But I personally would highly recommend starting with the Farsi trilogy first. I made a whole video about it. You can like go watch it. Okay, just avoid the spoiler talk and then go into the Last of Trader trilogy because it is just so, so fucking worth it. Like I know it's honestly like a whole different set of characters set in a different part of the world. The payoff, the payoff, it is just so, so good in the long run, okay? And I know it's a lot because each book in of itself is around 900 pages. Like this series is a lot longer and a lot more just 
time investing in general, okay? All right, so if you didn't know what the series is about, it essentially takes place in this huge entire realm, the realm of the Elderlings. And this is the second part, the second trilogy, when I'm talking about publication order, of this whole series. This second part, the second trilogy, follows a different part of the world. In the first one, we're like up north, and in this one, we're going down south. And this time, we're actually in a different format as well, since we're following like a set of whole new characters. And this is all like third person point of view, okay? I actually thought that distinction, reading wise, was more interesting. I actually prefer first person in general, but that's just me. I know a lot of you guys actually prefer third person point of view. So if you're wondering and really, really unsure of whether to start Forrester Trilogy or The Last of Trader Trilogy, um, take into account into the fact that the first series primarily is more private, personal, and intricate, while in this one, it's more, I would say, fulfilling and more exciting just because there are so many characters that you have to deal with that just when they all come together, it's just great, right? So that depends on you. It's third person, lots of characters, multiple POVs, while in the first one is like first person, just following like one character in a single location at first, um, while in this one, you're like traveling all over the place. So depending on you, what you want to do, I would highly recommend actually reading in publication order. But if you really want to start off with the Last Trader Trilogy first, I would honestly tell you that it's okay to do so because I feel like so many people at this point have read the series in order, but have yet still garnered some enjoyment of the series overall, right? But today, um, overall, I'm just going to be talking about, you know, how I felt about this whole series overall. Yes? If you missed my cat video where I announced that I now have a baby, um, yeah, his name is Pure Nessie. Say hello. <laughs> what was that? Yes? Did you say something? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them. I'll let them know. Um, hey guys, Pierre Nessie um, said to go and read the Last of Trader Trilogy um, if you haven't yet. So, there you go. I told them. Are you happy? <laughs> Are you going to keep talking? Can I, can I go back and talk about my books now? I think collectively I'm going to go and talk about what the... Can I actually finish talking about the series first, Pierre Nessie? The series primarily follows this family, as well as a plethora of different multitude of characters on their adventures, such as pirates, sea serpents, as well as the mysterious last ships and their secrets. And uh, yeah, that's basically the plot of this whole series overall. Um, did I get that right? I did. I got it off of uh, Wikipedia because uh, it could obviously explain it better than I ever could. So thank you, Wikipedia. Yeah, that is pretty much the series in a nutshell. And obviously there are so many hidden, deeper layers and aspects to the series overall. It's just honestly so good. The last ships in themselves and how they work is just very fascinating to me. These last ships are ships that are made from this special type of wood called wizard wood. And get this, they basically come to life, have a mind of their own, can speak and move and do things after three familiar generations have died on that ship, on their wood. And we follow this one specific family of traders and they have this one daughter who expects to sort of inherit this ship. However, things don't go that way, things don't go as planned. And so we basically follow her one POV on this journey to obtain her family ship back um, in her name. There are obviously a lot of other POVs that you follow. You also follow a pirate who has secrets of his own, who has all the luck in the world as well as sea serpents. So that is basically the explanation of the whole series in a nutshell. Um, the first book is the shortest and by far I think the weakest for me. I think I had too much, too high of expectations going in. I give the first book three to five stars. Okay, now listen, three stars is not a bad rating. However, there are like good three star reads and then there are bad three star reads. For me, this one follows somewhere in the middle but towards the good. My expectations going from the farce here to this was so high because so many people were saying that this was like their favorite and the best trilogy of all time. Don't get me wrong, it's warranted, it's there, that title belongs to the series overall. However, I think it's collectively as a whole. Each book on its own, um, I think progressively gets better. But this one by far for me was the weakest out of the bunch. I want to say the first quarter of the book was the strongest for me and the ending sort of brought it all back. However, the middle part was where it sort of dragged. There were so many things, so many lackluster things that were happening that I thought was really slow and just wasn't as interesting. I wasn't really invested in these characters because here's the thing. The thing with Robin Hobb in the first place is that all of her characters, all of them, go through this tumultuous change at the end of the book, um, at the end of the third book. Like honestly, it's about their whole journey overall. It's all about these human beings, the tribulations and the trials that they have to go through to get to where they are today, right? Or in the third book. It felt to me that almost every single character in this book was sort of like a reflection of Fitz's character 
adult character in the last book. And if you watched my previous video where I talked about the Farsight trilogy, I said that Fitz's adult character really irritated me the most because of how naive, close-minded, and just how irritable he was, right? This was reading every single character from Fitz's point of view with his characteristics that is close-minded, being naive, and just being so irritating and spoiled. Like, it literally... <sighs> There's also this one character in here. <clears throat> Malta! That just... I don't... Okay. Let's just say, bottom line, um, I didn't enjoy any of the characters in this book. If you don't enjoy any of the characters in the book that you're reading, it's very hard for you to sort of connect to the story overall, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I did like it. I do appreciate the first book overall. But yeah, this sets up a lot of things, a lot of the characters, a lot of backstory. I would say that if you're not a fan of slow-paced character development and characterization, then honestly, Robin Hobb might not be the best uh, author for you to get into because all of her books even though in fantasy setting, she basically takes her time to hone and craft these characters in these complex layers that are just, it's just so beautiful to read from. And if that's like not your thing, if you're looking for like action packed, like fighting scenes, a lot of magic, a lot of chaos, there isn't too much of that going in, I would say in the first one and a half books. Um, I would say the later half gets into that very heavily, but at the end of the day, she does take her sweet time. And honestly, I'm here for it. So just to give you guys a heads up in that warning in that regard, I would say, however, there is more magic and just more fantasy elements overall in this trilogy than the Farsi trilogy. And also regarding the magic in this trilogy overall, it's just very different because they stand apart from one another. Like the magic that's introduced in the Farsi isn't as relevant in this series overall. Side characters and characters that are like briefly mentioned or seen only once in this trilogy in the first book, like it is just so cool and so fantastic to see their progression or how they stand out in like the last later books. It's just so wild how she sort of connects all of these like different little details and different things, like little Easter eggs that she like, you know, subtly hints in the first book just come to like fruitation by the end of like the last book. So I think that's pretty much all I want to say regarding all the non-spoilers. And so do yourself a favor if you have yet to read the Farsuit Trilogy or the Last of Trader Trilogy, I highly definitely recommend. So it is up to you. I would actually you know, personally recommend reading the Farseer Trilogy first before you dive into the Last Ship Trader Trilogy um, and then going into the third one. I'm really hoping to read and complete the third set of the trilogy um, by this year because I feel like, I mean, I finished, what, all 900 pages of each consecutive book this year and I feel like it's doable. Now, I'm like no longer afraid of like big books because I fucking did it, okay? even though each book was a varying degrees of how long it took to read it. But the first one I think took me, it did take me, I don't want to say a while, but I did get into this one and it sort of like dragged in the middle. And I finished it in March. And so with the second book, this one took me a while to get into just because I felt like from the first book, I gave it like three stars. I was like, please pray, please Robin Hobb, don't fail me and listen. I will never doubt Robin Hobb ever again because this one was just so good, especially like the last I want to say 30% of this one, it's just, it's huge. It escalates, okay? Things get very big and so many characters just progress like from zero to a hundred real quick. And then by the third one, everyone and everything, how they progress, it's just a beautiful outcome in of itself. I also want to give it props to close everyone's story out in like a very satisfying way. I wouldn't even mind if there was sort of like a fourth shorter book detailing the lives of these characters after the math of everything that happened, right? Please don't spoil for me if these characters do appear later in the books or which books they do appear in because I think I want to, you know, keep that surprise for myself. I already know that some of these characters do appear later in the books, but I don't want to know who. I want to keep it a surprise, just as there were a lot of really, really good surprises that went on for this one. There you go. That is my non-spoiler review and talk for this trilogy overall. Please let me know down in the comments if you have actually read it. What did you think about it? So yeah, if you do want to talk spoilers, make sure you just like, you know, leave a spoiler warning in the comments somewhere down below. I mean, to close out, this is one of the best trilogies I've ever read. I think for me, it tops Farseer in the fact that it was just more fulfilling and satisfying to read from. I mean, just because it had so many different characters, so many plots and storylines going on. All right, and so there you have it, folks. Now I'm going to be diving into spoilers. Okay, let's get into spoilers. So before we get further into the video, a message from Future Elias about today's video sponsor. Squarespace gives people a powerful and beautiful online platform from which you can create your website, connect with your audience, and generate revenue through gated members only content. From there, you can manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights. 
all on one easy to use platform. You can essentially create a community on your Squarespace website with fully integrated commenting system that supports comments, replies, and likes. You can also use their powerful blogging tools to also categorize, share, and schedule your posts, and even utilize their great third party tools and extensions, including inventory, promoting products, and even streamlined bookkeeping. There are so many creative frames, templates, and themes to choose from. It's all super easy and engaging to use. And you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace slash Elias to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Everything will be linked below. And thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. All right, so where to begin and where to start? Okay, I think I know what I'm gonna start off with. You guys, what the fuck? When I was posting my reading journey on Instagram, a couple of you guys DM'd me and were like, so how do you feel about Amber? For the longest time, I didn't even get this until I was in the middle of the third book. You know, this whole entire time I was thinking to myself, what's the deal with Amber? What did I miss? Did I miss something that happened in the previous books? And so I looked it up on Google. <sighs> Amber is the fool? What? Okay, I was so fucking shook when I read that. I literally screamed because you already know me. The Fool is literally one of my favorite characters of the entire franchise, this entire series, right? To think that Amber is the Fool and the Fool is Amber? I was shook. Shook if I, I didn't even know how to process that because it, like, it just like exploded my mind. And so I had to literally put down the third book and just like think back and go back to all the interactions that Amber had with everybody. And I was just like, Oh my fucking god, it made so much sense. Hello, Elias. Like, the fool is really good with the wood. He's like a carpenter, right? He's really good with his hands and all that. And Amber is the same way. And she sort of has like this peculiar side. And there are so many instances where they both have like a similar characteristic, especially like in their eyes and like their pale gold eyes and everything. And then there are more like subtle, bigger hints later on in the third book. But I'm extremely glad. I was so glad that I did not look up anything about Amber until I was like in the middle of the third book. Because I felt like if I had looked it up earlier, then I feel like I would have like spoiled myself, even though in the entire series, there's no like direct mention that, oh, I I'm the fool from the Farseer trilogy. You know, I know all about Fitz. Maybe if I had not looked it up, maybe if I had been like, you know, just stayed away from the internet and just kept on reading, I think I would have figured out eventually that is Amber might be in connection with the fool. I don't think I would have ever thought the fool is Amber. Like, duh, he's also really good at disguising himself, right? At disguises in general. But when she carved out um, a new face for Paragon in the shape of the Fitz, oh, my heart. Like, I think I would have made some like different connections here and there. But I mean, with the crooked nose and like the fact that his hair is tied back and oh, it was just, I was like, damn. Even Paragon even mentioned that, oh, you must have loved him because he wanted a face of someone that Amber loved. And it was Fitz and I was like, Fuck! Anyways, that to me, fucking mind blown. Like I was sitting in my bed for a, a good solid fucking 30 minutes, just reminiscing everything, just sitting in my thoughts, just shook, mind blown. The fact that I didn't even see this coming, like at all. So many people pieced it together. Oh, they're the same like character, like in the second book. But I was like, how? You know, I totally thought Amber was like her own separate character and that no characters from the Farsi trilogy would be even featured in this set trilogy. Anyways, that, that is just what I want to talk about with The Fool and Amber. I'm just so shocked. I was shocked, like to this day, I'm still shocked. I still cannot believe Amber or The Fool the same person because I went in so far with the trilogy, like halfway through the third book before I figured it out. It just made me rethink everything. I mean, I know for a fact that I'll be rereading the series um, much later on in my life and Oh my god, I'm just so excited to just reread and just figure out the Easter eggs and all the clues again and uh, it's gonna be a good time, but holy shit. Holy fucking shit. Please let me know down below. Again, when you put a spoiler, like, enter, 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 okay? Make sure you leave a huge spoiler warning. I don't want anyone getting spoiled. Like, it was just honestly the best surprise for me, like, to figure it out then and there. So many people figured it out, like, by book two, but listen, I'm just so oblivious and I was just like, Amber's cool. I was like, whatever. Like she, I, I didn't really feel that much for her, right? I, I kind of felt indifferent for her character in like the second book in the first half. I mean, later on, obviously I was like, she's cool, but she's weird. And she, for me, didn't have the same connection as I did with The Fool, but holy shit. Like, when did you guys figure it out? Did you even figure it out? I mean, if you're watching this, you obviously have read it, right? You fucking obviously have read it, right? If you have not yet read it, 
Shame, shame, fucking click off and just, you know, read the first book first. Speaking of characters, we're gonna move on and talk about fucking Malta. I think in the entire series so far, Malta had the most like character development I've ever seen in Red. Whereas in contrast with Wintro, Hayes' character development for me was more subtle but powerful at the same time. Like the characters that progress and have the most change for me was Malta, Wintro, and Ronica, kind of in that order. And I think those are the characters that stuck out most to me on their um, character change and character arc, but fucking Malta. Let's talk about Malta for a second. Listen, I know she's a fucking child, okay? We all say stupid shit growing up and doing things, but to me, ho, oh my God, holy mother of God, she was, she was like on another level. Malta, when I was reading about this kid in the first book, she literally made me swear off having kids of my own for the rest of my life. Like I didn't even want kids. I hated children. I couldn't even think or even look at children, other children in real life, like when I first read the book, like for like a month. I was like, don't even look at me. I did not see you. Children should be seen and not heard. I was like living for that statement right there. I was just like, fuck all the kids. Screw everyone under the age of 10. Even though she's like, what, 13, like the first book? I don't even know how old she is. Is she 13? Is she 13 or younger? I forgot. Oh my God. I literally thought she was the most annoying, irritable, most spoiled brat. I did not understand. I mean, I get it. We all were kids, right? But to, to read it, to read all the things that she would say and do and manipulate, like even her mom and grandma, and that in itself even got me more mad and infuriated me because I was like, fucking Kefria and Ronica were not paying attention or even noticing the side of her or even bending their backs to the whims of this child. And like Kefria was just spoiling her daughter and it just got me even more mad. I know you're not supposed to say anything bad about children, but fuck Malta, okay? I know you're not supposed to say or even mention like a distasteful joke about children, but I was like, you know what? Fucking call child services because I am about to just... <sighs> Let's just get out of the way, okay? Malta in first book, fucking hated her. Hated her guts, didn't care she was a child. She needed the biggest spanking of her life, okay? Malta, book two. I was like, whoa, what the fuck? Because to me, even though she did have sort of like a character arc, right? It was transformative. Her transforming arc was very, it was very subtle. It was almost in a way where we didn't even see it because so many months would pass by when reading from like these different POVs and different characters, right? In one moment, when we see Malta, she's like thinking about these adult decisions and, you know, making and saying these things that sort of make sense. And I'll be like, thank fucking God, this brat is finally saying stuff that finally makes sense, that I agree with. Thank God, right? Like a few months later, in between that, we're reading like different characters and different POVs. When we meet and read about Malta again, she's like a totally brand new person. And I'm like, wait, when did this happen? Like to me, there wasn't enough of a correlation between her character arcs per se, but even though I'm still here for it, because you do see some of that arc later on in the third book and how her character develops. But in the beginning, when she does like begin her arc and journey, I wasn't really here for it because I couldn't really experience it, if you get what I mean. Like there were so many times or so many moments that would pass um, where we sort of got to read about different chapters of Malta's life where I've been like, okay, so I guess things are changing behind the scenes, which in and of itself I do appreciate because it just means that, you know, things are happening simultaneously in different parts of the world with these different characters. So yeah, I like her character overall. The fact that she became a boss ass bitch, a girl boss, later on in the third book was great and just the payoff for her character, especially from the first book, man, I just wanted to clap. Actually, I'm gonna clap. It was just that good. I kinda honestly wanted to see more about sort of like her story, her arc as the elderly queen, as the one that was chosen by Tin Tintaglia, the dragon. I still can get her name right. What is it, Tintaglia or something like that? Talking about Malta, let's talk about her brother. Her brother also had a very interesting arc because in the first book and in the second book, you don't really see much of him. You don't really care about him. Like he's just like this little baby, this child. And you're like, whatever, she has his brother and didn't really stick out much to me, right? However, in like the last portion of the second book, he became somewhat important. And in the third book, he becomes extremely important as like a minister or the voice for the dragon, which I thought was really cute. His relationship with like the dragon, every time he would praise her and say all this like, ridiculous shit to her, I've been like, oh my god, you're so cute. He was great. I really like Selden. See, the thing about Robin Hobb is that she introduces like all these great characters later on to me in like the last book where I'm just like, I want to see more of that progression. I kind of want to see more of that character development of like certain characters together later on. But alas, it was not meant to be and I'm okay with it. So I guess we're talking about Malta. We can talk about the rest of her family. Her mother, Kefria. Kefria to me was very annoying, especially in the first book. She would just literally listen or just whine with her daughter as well. And I was just not here for it. However, she also had a significant change later on. Kefria to me would probably fit down in like the lower scale of characters that I enjoyed reading from in this whole 
series. After Kefria, Ronica. Ronica to me had the third best character arc and I really really enjoyed reading from a character just because she was like the oldest character I believe that we're reading from and she is just badass, steel spine strong on her own. Things that she would say and stand up for was just really great to see and read especially in the last book. I think in the last book everybody's character just elevated for me but don't get me wrong in the first book she was also a little frustrating to read from as well. I mean, just her interactions with Kefri and Malta themselves, I mean that trio in the first book killed me. Fuck, I hated it. But now everything is great, it's going smoothly, and so yeah, really liked Veronica. Hope nothing but the best for her. Who is next? Wintro. So in the beginning, in the first book, I related with Wintro really hard, hardcore, because I grew up and raised in a very Catholic, conservative um, environment, right? I could sort of relate to why Wintro in the beginning would always sort of regulate and justify the things that he would believe in and say his beliefs in his religion. And I get that religion in itself is a really big and instrumental parts in his character, in his character arc as well. His character arc to me, like I said before, was very subtle but powerful and also spiritual as well. With Wintro, I really enjoyed his transformation overall, coming into the belief that it's still okay to believe in your religion and to practice it, but also not to enforce or justify or say certain things or do certain things in the name of religion on other people, right? However, towards the end, his character really just diminished in my eyes when it came to Althea. So I'll get to her in a moment, but when Althea was raped by Kenneth, no one believed her. And that to me was just so sad and heartbreaking because it does, you know, mimic society where women are sexually assaulted and when they bring it up, their voices are silenced, no one believes them. You know, there are some parallels there. But Wintro, her fucking brother, come on. I was like, Wintro, this whole character arc and development and his faith in Kenneth. But Kenneth is another fucking thing. Okay, but we're talking about Wintro for now. Wintro really was really strong for me, especially in the third book, but I want to say in that last portion, I was just like, fuck you. Screw you, bitch. I think overall that's all I wanted to say about Wintro. I have a question. I know that the skill has to be sort of like inherited, but to me it seemed like didn't Wintro have like some sort of the skill? Because there's so many passages or times when like specifically when he was talking to Amber, he was talking about this one time when he was a kid, there was a lightning bolt that struck a tree and he felt like this supercharge or something like that that like passed over him. But I was like, was that just like electrical currents? Do you have like some smidge of the skill in you? I don't know. I also don't understand the tie-in with Amber wanting or needing to find the nine-fingered slave boy that is Wintro. What was the big correlation there? I didn't really understand it or get it. Like the conversation was a little bit iffy to me. So if you guys had read that part and just want to clear it up for me down in the comments below, I would greatly appreciate it. And so yeah, I'm just wondering if you know, Wintro has some set of the skill. Maybe that's why the fool slash Amber is trying to find him. And so yeah, that is just my overall thoughts on Wintro. Okay, who's next? I think we're gonna talk about um, Athea, I guess, Althea. There's so many times where I'll be like, Althea, Athea, Althea, I don't know. Her name is just so interesting to me, but at the same time, I kind of don't know how to pronounce it. So Althea to me, I thought was going to be the most pivotal main character. Like I honestly thought we would be reading the most from her. And I honestly thought everything or everyone else would be revolving around her storyline. But it's sort of like the opposite. Her story was interesting enough, but to me, out of all the characters that I read from, her story arc was the most boring to me. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy her as a character, but to me she literally only had one single-minded focus was to get her family shit back. You know, that's fine and all, but to me, other characters had so much more layers and depth to them, just made them more interesting. Like honestly to Althea, the only remotely thing I could find interesting about her character was her driven will and strength to find and inherit her family ship. Her whole goal in like the entire trilogy, I guess that's fine, you know, but when other characters are doing so much and have so much more in them, I mean, it's just, they take the cake for this one. Like the character I thought I'll be reading like the most from and rooting most for, like was the opposite, was like the least, right? Like her and Brashen overall were like the most uninteresting characters to me. Brashen and Althea together, sure, they're fine. Honestly, couldn't really care less for their romance for each other. I honestly shipped her with Grag until like the end where he was just like, oh, he just wanted like a housewife, someone to like protect and love or whatnot. And so I was like, Ugh, it's 2022, Althea can never. <laughs> her and Brashen, sort of like friends to enemies to lovers here, but I mean, I can't really say much about them because I couldn't really care much about them overall. Like Brashen, he was probably my least favorite character of the entire roster of characters, right? His arc and Athelia's arc was just um, the most uninteresting to me. Don't really have much to say about them other than the fact that I did like where it went with Paragon and how he's sort of like the captain of that ship. I mean, it sort of all made sense, right? And I really like how at the end, Athelia didn't even get her ship. 
Vasia, right? Athlea didn't end up being the captain or even bonding or even going on that ship. It was Wintro, and I felt like that was more fitting. Yeah, so I honestly appreciated that aspect where she belonged with Brashen on Paragon. I think their dynamic with Paragon was more interesting to read about than the single POVs from either Brashen or Athlea separate. Together, it was more condensed where I was like, finally, you're all in one spot. Like, I don't have to read separate POVs from you guys, you know? And together with Paragon, it made it even more interesting to read from because there were just so many different interactions and relationship dynamics that were just better to read from, right? I think that's all I have to say about those three. But speaking of Paragon, that twist where he became Igroth's ship and that and that he was Kenneth's ship originally, huge twist, did not see that coming like at all, was very surprised by it. And yeah, so finding that out was also very subtle because the thing with Robin Hobbs twists, most of them are so subtle. You don't even see them coming. She just like briefly mentions it and, like in the middle of this like one paragraph that she's like talking and you're like, wait, what? You sort of have to like go back and reread it and everything sort of like clicks together. Like all like the things that were said or mentioned or how they acted, it all comes together like full circle, full finish, and it's just great. Speaking of Kenneth, Kenneth to me was probably the most layered, complex character I've ever read in any book in my entire life when it came to a villain. Like it's even hard for me to even distinguish the word villain with Kenneth, right? I honestly thought he was sort of like this good character slash gray moral pirate who would turn hero towards the end. But in fact, it was like the complete 180 opposite, right? His character was just so different from everyone else just because of how layered and complex he was. Like, you obviously don't agree with what he believes or what he says, right? He is such a gaslighting motherfucker. Like, what are the three Gs? He was a gatekeeping, gaslighting, girl-bossing bitch. I've never seen the amount of luck that he has. Holy fucking shit. Things that he could get away with and say astounded me. I could not believe the amount of people that fell for his bullshit. Like he truly had the best luck in the world. And to me, his luck in and of itself was very interesting because that luck was sort of like a subsidiary effect that was put upon him by Paragon, right? Because Paragon took like away his like his deepest, darkest nightmares and, and like sort of gave him a goal like to survive, right? Or did I miss something here? Like his luck was just like another attribution of its own. It was just so interesting. Things that he would say, especially towards Etta, oh my God, poor Etta. Like I really liked Etta from the beginning and I was just waiting. I was just waiting for her to drive that dagger into Kenneth's back, okay, at the end. If that never happened, I honestly am very unsatisfied with how his character ended. I think I wanted more retribution to the things that he did, especially to Althea. Like, he fucking raped her, and that, to me, destroyed any semblance of sympathy that I had for this character. Even though his character did such an evil thing, I can't help but feel sort of empathetic towards him at the end. You're reading about him for such a long time and getting to know his character and his development, just his upbringing, it's just so heartbreaking and sad at the same time. But it just tells you when it comes to Robin Hobb and her characters, she is just on a whole nother level with them. In the first two books, I really felt from this character, I really felt like, oh, there's gonna be some tumultuous change, right? No, he just stays on like the same course this entire time because of his ego, because he thinks that he's just gonna win it all. And at the end, he loses everything. He deserved way more for what was coming to him than what he got. Like it was just way too easy and way too abrupt. And I think that in of itself, it's very purposeful, very deliberate as to how you feel about this character at the very end. Like I've literally never met such a character who is just gaslighting everybody, left and right, even himself. Like it was just honestly on a whole another level. Like even Vivasia, I would have thought like Vivasia from the very beginning, she'd be like the smart, intelligent, sentient being, right? Absolutely not. She's just essentially a child born from these memories come to life. Talking about live ships in general, how they came forth and how they came to be was so interesting. They essentially come from the memories of these dragons who have either died or just metamorphosizing in these cocoons. Whole dragon lore and how they came to be was just so interesting to me and all the otherlings. I think you read and know more about the otherlings in this trilogy than in the farce here. It honestly gives you a lot more to work with. So yeah, I thought the whole elderling, lost city, dragons thing from their previous world or their previous time in that world was um, really great to read from. But yeah, overall, I am very curious to see sort of like what happens, what has progressed after um, the dragons have hatched and how the public, you know, knows about them. I think the public now are slowly accepting um, dragons now because now that sea serpents are seen as like normal, which also sea serpents, their whole journey was also very interesting as well. In the beginning, I was a little iffy. I didn't fully get or understand like their chapters at first when I got into it, but slowly after a while, it sort of builds and you kind of, you kind of get it. I think at the end of like the first book, I sort of had like a hunch that dragons had to do something with on live ships and also like the sea serpents as well. But it wasn't until like the later half of the second book where I was like, okay, I see it now. Oh yeah, the satrap. 
what a fucking annoying character as well. You know, for a series that have so many characters, not a lot of them actually died or even perished. Like literally the satrap Kazuga was such a terrible character. In the end, he still got reinstated to power and everything. And like to me, he was still the same person from when we met him the first time until when he was like reinstated at the end of the book where I was just like, what the fuck? You know, I thought more, there would be more repercussions for him. Literally nobody died aside from Kenneth, which is very interesting. But for the main parts, most of the cast, most of everyone survived, which makes me wonder if any of these characters, major characters, will appear later on in the books. I'm very excited to see that. This series is an all-time new favorite. It also gave me goosebumps when I finished it and read it. I think that's pretty much it. I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting something, but also let me know what you guys thought. If you guys enjoyed it, who's your favorite, who's your least favorite, which I think. All right, and so with that being said, thank you so much for watching, guys, and I will see you all soon with a new video.